So I'm Dave Patty, and I'd like to introduce two of my kids. Why don't you guys come up? We'll be doing this together. This is Tyler and Claire, and uh, both of them grew up in the Czech Republic and ha are now also serve on our Josiah Venture team, which is the mission that I serve with, and they'll be helping me with this session. And we were hoping to have one more, actually the most important member of this team, my wife, Connie, and she is sick with bronchitis, uh, strep throat, and uh, sinus infection all at the same time. So she's in bed and talking about like this, and so she'll be praying for us today, but we're, we're going to miss her, her input, and I wish she could be here. So that's, that's kind of our teaching team. So um, <clears throat> we're, we're happy to be with you here for this time. Uh, we have lived and served in the Czech Republic for 25 years, and as uh, missionaries there, like I said, my kids grew, grew up there, but I'm also, they're, uh, they're actually third generation missionary. So I, uh, this is my family that I grew up in, and uh, there's me over on the left, my parents, Dick and Margaret Patty, and this picture was taken in the Philippines where I was born. So they were missionaries there. I moved back when I was about four or five years old, so I grew up in Denver. But uh, I had the privilege of growing up in a, in a missionary family, in a family that was engaged in not just missions, but in the mission, and uh, which I know all of you are engaged in that mission as well, which was a, a huge privilege for me. And so when our family moved to the Czech Republic, this was one of the things that was, was on my mind is how could it be not just my wife and I serving, but how together, even though we had small kids, so there's my wife in Habijov, which is not far from here, along with, uh, is that you, Tyler? Uh, I'm standing. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's uh, Tyler standing there on the right, a younger version of him. Uh, but as we, as we begin to engage in ministry, one of our questions was how could actually God's calling on our life be a blessing to our whole family? Not just be something we suffer through, but actually be a wonderful adventure we do together. How could it be something that, that, um, that, that is, it's not just the parents involved in, but the kids? And so that was one of my questions. And it wasn't always an easy question. This is, this is uh, the first day we landed. It's a younger version of me. Because even with small kids, we were wondering how, how does that look? And uh, they were in the thick of a lot of ministry. We had a youth group meeting at our house, and you can see that there's Tyler down there and uh, Caleb in the middle. Uh, you could kind of see their heads popping up in a lot of our early ministry. So here's a, a camp we did, and, and there's our kids kind of front and center, uh, one right there and one right there. There's my wife, Connie, with, with Claire, a younger version of Claire. Uh, so uh, we were just asking, how, how can this be something we really do together? And then uh, also, then they, then they grew, and then they became teenagers. And those questions changed. They, they changed from just what does it mean to be along for the ride, but are there, are there ways we can actually serve God together? And, uh, and this is our family today, just taken about three weeks ago. So a couple of them are not here. This is Caleb, our uh, middle son, uh, along with his, his uh, wife, Haley, and grandson, Charlie. And they live and serve in Albania right now. So that's, it's really fun that... They're serving there. My wife and I, Connie. There's uh, there's Claire, and then Tyler with his wife Laura, and two more next generation Pags. Actually, we're we're praying that we get to the fourth generation of <laughs> family on mission. So we got them got them coming up too. So um, that's just some of the context why this question has been important to me is because of my family, but also because I work with a bigger team. Uh, this is our Josiah Venture family. Josiah Venture is a, a mission organization, an international organization that serves in 15 countries of Central and Eastern Europe, and they have a lot of families too. And so uh, I'm concerned about this question, not just for my family, but for the people I, I, I lead and, ser and, and serve with, because uh, one of the questions is the impact of their, of, of their service, but what would it be like if all those families were mobilized to be family on mission? So that's a, a question that often I have in my mind, as, as they serve in 15 countries of Central and Eastern Europe. And it's going to be great to hear Claire's voice uh, because she actually is in a full-time role serving these families, helping them raise uh, strong kids. She's involved in children's ministry to these families and helping the families learn how to be family on mission. So as, uh, as our time today goes on, she's going to be sharing you insights from about, oh, about 100 families. I don't know if there's that, that, is there that many involved. You don't know. There's 115 kids. 115 kids, okay. And they've also recently completed a survey where uh, they interviewed 50 people, uh, Claire and a team of, of uh, two others, over 52 hours, 32 kids and 18 parents asking the question, how do you raise healthy kids in ministry? 
from a ch children's perspective and also from a parent's perspective. So as we go on today, she'll be sharing with you some of the results of that and, uh, and some of the quotes from that. And if some of you are interested in reading some of that, we also have a, uh, that, that study bound <laughs> and just came out about, about three weeks ago if you're interested in just hearing what makes a family successful on mission. So that's just some of my context. There's, there's Claire with some of the 115 kids that she's shepherding and helping those families. And um, that, so that's just a little bit about our, our context and background. I actually think that when you're 80, if you make it that far, or 90, if you make it that far, uh, when you look back, one of the things that you will care most about is how you shepherded your family through these years. Uh, you, you may be in a church that's growing or in a ministry that's reaching lots of young people, but if you get down the road 10 or 20 years and you find out that you ruined your family in the process, um, just think how you'll feel about that. It's interesting to get down the road a little bit further and go, what, what are the things that bring me the greatest joy? Of, of all, I've been involved in seeing ministry grow and lots of people come to Christ, but I just have to say actually one of my greatest joys is seeing that my kids are walking with, with Christ and following him and, uh, and passing on that legacy to the next generation. So um, if that's true, it's interesting that we spend a lot of time preparing for church meetings and, uh, and organizing retreats and, and um, thinking about how to organize our ministry. But I, I would say most people don't spend much deliberate time thinking about how to be family on mission. They just think that that's going to happen sometime along the way. And then if it doesn't, they, they wonder how. And, and so I, I believe that this whole topic of family on mission really needs our focused attention. It's worth it. Uh, it's something you should be thinking about, evaluating, planning for, because I really think it will be, it, it could be one of your greatest treasures. And if you think even about our desire to impact this whole region with the gospel of Jesus Christ, what's it like when we tell people Jesus is the answer and that he, um, he changed our life and then they look at our family and go, your family is such a mess. Your kids think that you're a hypocrite and uh, they don't wanna be, this church that you're leading, they don't even wanna be at. Uh, just think how that, how that can discredit and, um, and uh, limit the cause of Christ. On the other hand, when your kids are actually talking about Jesus in fourth grade with their friends and, uh, and, and being a witness in the community and, and your family has a reputation of being uh, not just the ones who stand up in front of church, but, but they're a living life out every day, just think how that can extend your ministry. So I'm glad you're here today because I, I think this topic is actually much more important than any of us realize, and it's worth this whole afternoon and maybe even, even much more. So we're going to start with a tale of three families so that we can just see uh, what, and Tyler, what if you can get my Bible out of my briefcase? So it's, uh, uh, see that it's not automatic, that just because someone's in ministry doesn't mean necessarily their, their kids will be. Here's the first one, David's family, which is a great example of, of is it in there? Yeah, my Bible for now. I can have your Bible. <laughs> which is uh, an example of dad or mom in ministry. Uh, just think about what an amazing man David was. He was a great king, he was a great general, he was uh, a poet, and wrote so many of the Psalms. So think of the things that, that characterize him. Um, he's, think of David with Goliath. You know, there's a problem and he just jumps right into it. He just goes for it. I think of David in the Psalms, how he's challenging people to follow God and serve him. And, um, and think of David when he has the opportunity to kill Saul and he says, I won't raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. And you have this amazing character. So think that, that's the David we're talking about. And watch David as a dad. Okay, take a look at David as a dad. Kings, this is, I think this is 1 Kings. I didn't write that down there. So 1 Kings, yes it is. 1 Kings 1. Uh, 5 and 6. Now uh, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted him, saying, I will be king. And he uh, prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men before, uh, uh, before, to run before him. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, why have you done thus and so? He was also a very handsome man. He was born next after Absalom. He's just a little, little comment. He's saying, by the way, his dad 
never asked him why he's doing these things. And so you, you see him just taking the kingship, uh, kingship for him and um, just being a, 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 a super irresponsible son. Uh, what's, what's with David? And you find this actually in other places in David's life that uh, when he had problems like uh, with Goliath or other issues, he would step right into them. When he had problems with his kids, it's like he was powerless to do anything. I don't know if it was shame. Uh, I don't know if it was, uh, but, but remember some of the, his, the problems in his family and how he would leave them go for years without addressing them. And then, and then when he finally did, uh, he stepped into them and would either be too harsh or too soft. So we, we find David is just being outstanding as a leader and a follower of God and really bad as a dad. It, it didn't, didn't really get on to the next generation. I told you I grew up in a mission organization and I had a, a couple of very close friends. One of his, his name is Dan and I'm actually serving today with Dan. Dan serves in Poland and we serve on the same team. Dan's been a missionary for, uh, for also 25 years in this region. But one of our other good friends, whose name was Paul, uh, and uh, Paul got pretty rebellious in high school, then uh, started doing drugs, then robbed a bank, and uh, ended up in prison, and finally, about, uh, about eight years ago, took his life in a hotel room in Las Vegas, committed suicide, after being in and out of prison three or four years. And we were all, we were all friends when we were young. And all of our parents were in ministry together. And you take a look at that and you go, well, what, what was the difference? Uh, he, he knew the Bible. In fact, he could preach. <laughs> he was uh, quite gifted. He'd been around it all. But I would say that his dad was a little bit like David, was, was very gifted and uh, talented, but didn't know how to step into his son's issues and did a lot of this, like, oh, I don't know what to do. And uh, he, it was not family ministry, it was dad or mom in ministry. So we don't want to be like that, and, and we could. You could, no guarantee that your children will walk with God. Uh, a number of, of David's didn't. Then there's Joshua's family, which this is, this is an interesting one. So uh, Joshua, we'll look at this passage in Joshua 24, 15. And he says, uh, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Okay, just take note of that. This is Joshua saying, me and my house will serve the Lord. And the people answered, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers from the land of Egypt out of the land of slavery. And he did this great sign in our sight and preserved in all the way that we went and among all the people we passed. And then, um, and the Lord drove us out, drove out before us all the peoples. The Amorites lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord for he is God. Did you catch something about the difference between what Joshua said and what the people said? Joshua said, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And then uh, the, the people said, we will serve the Lord, which is interesting. They didn't say, our, us and our house will serve the Lord. So uh, you, you, it, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting observation. And then, then you, you find in Judges 2, 6 through 10, When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went out to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and they, and they went on like that. And then a little bit later, it talks about the fact that as soon as that happened, look at verse 11, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers. So here you see that, that David's kids are rebelling while he's still around. Joshua's, that generation, serves as long as mom and dad are there. So mom and dad are on mission. They're not just in ministry, they're on mission. Uh, their kids are, are with them in that. But as soon as that influence is gone, they're not able to pass it down to the next generation. 
So uh, you see somehow it gets stopped. There's no outward rebellion as long as that first generation is around, but the next generation left. They didn't really get it to the next generation. And then um, we have this view of the, the father's family. So um, Jesus on mission with his dad. And I want, to, I want us to look at some verses about how Jesus talks about his mission and particularly about how he relates to his father in the midst of this. So, so now we're in the, you know, we're in the perfect family, the family of the Trinity. Luke 2, 49. And we'll see how Jesus talks about, and just kind of make some observations as we're going, as we're going through this, 2.49. So Jesus is 12 years old. He's found in the temple. They've been looking for him for three days. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? Okay, John 12, 49 through 50. And... He says, I've not spoken my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me a command what to say and how to speak. So there's just, there's just this kind of this warm connection to his family that's very empowering to him that he's not pushing off against. And then in John 20, 21, he says, um, as the Father sent me, so I send you. So he, he like even reaches back in his family for authority to empower others. So you can see Jesus is actually ministering in very much family on mission ways with his father. And, um, and it's very relational. It's very um, respectful and honoring both directions, very empowering. So uh, how could that kind of tone be the tone of family on mission for us? That's how I want us to kind of get that in our head. And, um, and also understand that, that God's rescue mission is the family business. And it, this, is, this is the... He, 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 was, uh, he was on his father's mission, and that was the family business. And so one of the, one of the thoughts for us is, is God's res rescue mission our family business? Um, and, and that's even bigger than an organization or than a church or than a particular role or than an event. It's this mission that God the Father's on. But you could see that he, you know how people would say, that's the family business. You know, that's what we do in this family. In this bigger family of God, which our smaller families are part of, uh, he's on this rescue mission, and he invites us, invites us into it. And uh, just with that, I want to turn things over to Tyler to take us a little bit deeper kind of into, because we're, we're thinking about the theology of this. How do we have good theology running in the background as we think about how to create family and mission in our homes? And so here you go. It might not be obvious, but, um, but it, is to, it was to me that all this was very obvious to me growing up because this is very much a part of our family culture that, yes, God's rescue mission is our business. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that looked practically in our family growing up and stuff. But um, I was a little surprised that uh, when I got to, to, to dig a little bit deeper into Scripture when I was, uh, went to university and went on to study Biblical Hebrew, digging into the Old Testament, I was a little surprised that actually that's very much God's heart. Uh, the family is not an afterthought uh, to God's rescue plan. It's actually central to it. And, uh, and I believe that a, a theology of family on mission is a great antidote to some of the, the uh, over-individualization indiv that happens in our cultures. An, an unhealthy amount of focus on the individual person um, it helps us refocus on what is God doing in, in community and especially in the, in the family. So um, the first question we have to ask is, what is the mission? What is the mission? And um, I think the best place for, to answer this question is to go back to the very beginning. Um, go back to Genesis 1, where God creates humanity, and it says that um, God says, uh, so God created man in his own image, an image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and every, every, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Right from these opening pages of scripture, we see that, that family is central to God's mission, to God's intentions, to his purposes with creation. When God creates humanity in his image, uh, they're supposed to be his, his princes and princesses. 
or his statues is another way to translate that word image. They're supposed to be his representatives in the world to image him uh, to the world and to, to spread his, his own kingship. And so then uh, their own sub subduing, their own dominion um, is supposed to be a reflection of God's heart as a king, which is not to, to over, overrule his creation, not to, not to pu be pushy, but to invite into, uh, into something much greater, to, to spreading his goodness, uh, to spreading his, his, uh, his glory. And so we see, though, that already, be fruitful and multiply. He's talking to the first two humans, and say, he's saying to them, it's central to my intentions for the world is that you develop family, that you develop a family culture that reflects my heart, that, uh, that, and that you carry this on. It doesn't stay with you, but that this is passed on. To the next generation. And so the mission is, the mission is, is God's own creation uh, plan, his plan for redemption, his plan for restoration, bringing what he started in Genesis 1 to completion. That's our mission. We get to partner with God in that, and it's amazing. So what is the mission? Um, we start to get to, to, to track this a little bit more, and we see that, that come Abraham, this starts to really become more concrete. This is Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we see, even from the election of Abraham, there are two important things that happen. First is a break with Abram's previous family. Abram came from, from Ur, and then they relocated to Haran, and those were both centers of, of, uh, of worship of the moon and of the, of the stars and of the sun. And so Abram is coming from a very idolatrous background, and God is calling him to make a clean break and create a new family culture. We all did that. If you're married, then you understand what that means to, to make a break and to create a new family culture with your spouse. But this is, this is something massively significant. Go. To leave that behind, and, and I, will, I, will, I will guide you as you go to the land I will show you. And the purpose of this, this blessing, this, even this attention that Abram is getting, is not just for his own benefit. It's so that his, through him, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so his family has a mission that's going to impact other families. So it's family on mission to bless other families and to see God's glory spreading through other families. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We see this track a little bit farther on when, when, when Israel comes, uh, comes together as a nation once they're, once they're uh, delivered from Egypt. It's a, a little bit bigger family, but we're still talking about a family. We're still called the sons of Israel, the children of Israel. It's still a family. And this is what uh, God tells them as they sit, as they stand under Mount Sinai after having just been, just been uh, delivered from Egypt. Thus you shall say, he's talking to Moses, to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation." This is crucial. The, the, uh, the starting point for Family on Mission is that, that, that God made the first move. You yourself saw how I bore you on eagle's wings. I made the first step. I rescued you before you could do anything for me, before you, could, before you could represent me in any way, before you could know me. I took the first step. And now that I've rescued you, now that I've called you as my people, now you have a mission. And the mission for Israel is that that they would be a kingdom of priests, that they would mediate God's, God's presence to the world. And they would be a holy nation. They'd be set apart in a way that when people look at them, they say they see God. So their, 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 their calling is based on the fact that God has already stepped out and rescued them. And their mission is that they would represent God and pass on what they've received to other families. All the peoples of the earth are mine, God says. But you guys, you guys are special because 
you've received something that you need to pass on. Now, as we know, they didn't always do that very well. We see God's broken heart as a father most, uh, a lot in the prophets, but I think most um, kind of painfully in, in Hosea, Hosea 11. This is what God says as, as Israel's father. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. I delivered him. I did the first, I, I initiated the covenant. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. And a little bit farther on, he says, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Zeboim, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. This is great encouragement to us uh, who may have experienced the pain of seeing a child rebel against the mission or against God. That God is not... God is not a stranger to these kinds of feelings uh, of seeing a son that he loves receive everything and walk away. And his his heart, it it, it pulls up all the emotions, the deep emotions inside the Lord because he cares so much about his children receiving the good that he has for them and then passing it on. So it doesn't always work perfectly, but, but, but the intentions are there and God's heart remains the same. Continuing on to the family of God, the church in particular. One of the, 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 the biggest um, causes of division in the early church was actually who gets to be a part of God's family? Who and how do they enter in to this, to this covenant, this, this covenant community? And so we, we read uh, in Acts uh, that one of the big issues was, well, you know, if Gentiles are coming into the, to the church or they're joining the, the community of the saved, following the Messiah, do they have to be circumcised? What does it take for them to join the family? And, and Paul and others are very uh, adamant um, the fa- for the fact that, that their, in, their inclusion is, is based, again, on God's own initiative, that God is the one who initiates, and that that alone uh, means that they're a part of the family. It's, it's by faith. And so in Ephesians, um, he talks about this in just a beautiful way. I love Ephesians 3. When you read this, you can hear Paul's, Paul's heart. He's just, he's, this is a topic that is so close to his heart. You can perceive my insight in, into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been re- revealed to his holy apostles and prophets, uh, by the Spirit. Uh, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And, and a little bit earlier, he says that those near and far have been brought together and made into one family. They're, we're all fellow heirs. We're all part of God's family. We're all family on mission together. Whether you've grown up in the family or whether you're coming in as a first generation um, mission, missions person, um, you're all part of the family. And I just love in, in Ephesians 3, he's just so overwhelmed by this amazing truth that God's family, the boundaries of God's family is expanding. And that's really what, what happens when Jesus, uh, when Jesus breaks open the doors and opens, opens wide the gates. He, he extends the boundaries of what family on mission can mean. And so Paul just exults, just can't help himself in Ephesians 3. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We all have the same Father, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This, this boundary extension, this new family, this, this beautiful representation of who God is, it just, it just causes such joy in Paul's heart. And he wants the people who are reading this, and he wants us to understand how amazing this is and how God's love is evident in, the, in, in God's family in the church. The passing on of faith continues also. The, the boundaries are extended, but it's not 
the passing on of faith, the passing on of the mission is not just through the bloodline anymore, although it still continues. And most beautifully, I think, in Timothy, where Paul writes to Timothy saying, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God. So stop, we'll stop there. That's something that, that, that he received from his, from his mother and from his grandmother, but it's something that he had to receive for himself as well. Fan into flame what you've received. And a little bit farther in chapter 3, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He's been acquainted with the scriptures from a young age. It's been a part of their family culture because this family was family on mission. And they were not only family on mission as their unit, but they were also part of the, the bigger family of God mission in the church, the, the extended boundary mission. Um, and Timothy becomes a pastor. So he received something and he needed to pass it on. Now this, this is all central to God's heart and who he is because God himself is a family on mission in the Trinity. Just this is amazing. John 14 in, in Jesus' uh, address, to, final address to his disciples in John, he talks about what, what, what it means for him to be on mission with his Father and with the Spirit and how they can be invited into this. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me and I in you. All through this address, we see how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all, are all on mission together. They're all working in the same direction, covering different, different spots, um, but all moving in the same direction of mission. And here we see Jesus asking the Father to send the Spirit, the Spirit of truth, that will dwell in them and that will confirm the fact that they are no longer orphans. And this is beautiful, that the family of the Trinity is, is also a family with extending boundaries, with extending borders, because... The hope is that we actually get to part, be a part of God's family. The hope is that we won't be left as orphans, but that we'll be included in God's very own family. So he's extended the borders for us so that we can join him in his mission. And really, what is his mission but the, the Great Commission? And I believe that the Great Commission is actually a, a repatterning of the first commission in Genesis 1 to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, to spread God's kingship, spread his glory um, throughout the world and, and carry on the creation project that God began. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I am the king. I am the king. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is a, a family on mission with extending boundaries that invites people to join in, to be full members of God's family, to experience all the blessings of being a son, especially a son of God. And it's also a mission that, or a family that carries a mission, that carries a DNA um, of movement, of making disciples and bringing others into the fold in the name of, of our family, our, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, under God's very own authority, under Jesus' kingship. And so the mission is the same from the beginning to today. It's that of extending God's kingship, his goodness, his glory, and extending the boundaries of the family so that more and more can be a part and experience God's love and his care and his goodness. So that, is, that kind of frames... Um, what we do as a family. Are we a family with extending boundaries that, that image God and his ki as, as king and also as father who, who feels deeply when things aren't, aren't right, especially in the family? 
And are we inviting others, uh, not just by having children, but are we inviting others into our family to see God um, through our family in all its brokenness? So that is a, a theology of family on mission. It really is important to think theologically about family on mission before we get to practical issues because our, our practical applications should come from a great understanding of theology. So keep these things in your mind as we move forward. And uh, we're going to start thinking about, okay, if that's our desire, if we want to be part of families like that, if we want to lead families like that, then how, how do we actually do that? And one of the pieces that we need to address right here at the beginning of that, as we, as we think, start to think practically, is this question of how do you balance family and ministry? It's probably a question that I hear more than any other single question. How do I balance family and ministry? And um, I remember asking that question many, many times. And one time I asked it of, a, of, a, of a, um, a, a very gifted Christian leader I knew. And I said, how do, how do you balance family and ministry? And he says, I don't. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I actually think that, that balance is unbiblical. And I went, what in the world are you talking about? So, so do you want to trash your family? He said, absolutely not. I said, well, do, do you want to? Uh, I, I just couldn't understand. And then he said, actually, when you frame something as a balance, you, 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 uh, you, build, in, uh, you build in an assumption that's not true. And let, me just, let me just draw this for you, because this is what he drew for me. He said, uh, if you say, I have family, and here I have ministry, or mission, and I say, what's the balance between family and ministry? Then uh, do you see that built into that question is the more I go towards ministry, the, the, I'm moving away from family. And the more I move towards family, I'm moving away from ministry. See, it's just built in there. So I go, okay, 50% ministry, 50% family. Or should it be 70% ministry, 30% family? But the assumption is that whatever I give to my family, I'm taking away from ministry. And whatever I give to my ministry, I'm taking away from my family. Do you see how that's built in? And sometimes we can think that way. So I make sure that I steal some from ministry to give my family, steal some from my family to give to ministry. And actually, the Bible never talks about, actually, the Bible doesn't talk about balance. Look up the word balance. Do a, a word study of balance. You don't find it. The, that's not actually a high value to God is keeping two things 50% and the other. Uh, he's got... It's actually a little bit more complex than that. We should be thinking of it more like this, that I, here's family, and here's ministry. And I can have a weak ministry and a weak family. I can have a strong family and no ministry. I can have a strong ministry and no family, but actually our goal would be to be family on mission, right? To be uh, a, a family that blesses the ministry and have a ministry that blesses the family and that they don't have to be fighting with each other. Actually, they can be benefiting each other. My ministry can be stronger because my family's healthy. My family can be more healthy because we're involved in ministry, that they're not necessarily fighting against each other. And I think now, obviously, some people trash their families in pursuit of ministry. Some people make their family an idol and never accomplish anything for God because they're just circling around, how can I? And, and, and sometimes that's actually not the best for your family. I remember when I was going to Bible college, the president came from a ministry family. In fact, his dad was the founder of that Bible college and he had 11 kids who were very much involved in ministry together. So his son became the next president and uh, married a woman who said, wait, wait, I don't like this mixing of family and ministry. Your ministry is a threat to the family. We're going to keep this separate. And so she very, very purposefully separated family and ministry. So we would see this president of the Bible college, but I don't even know what his wife looked like. I don't know what his kids looked like. They lived across town in another place, and she said, that's your ministry. Here's our family. The ministry is a threat to the family. We've got to keep them far, far apart. What's interesting is that none of those kids are walking with the Lord. That actually her desire to separate the ministry and the family in order to protect the family actually robbed the family of incredible riches that they could have had if they, if they were more involved. So I think we need to not be thinking about these things as, as uh, if God has called you. In fact, I remember my dad saying, he, he would say, I would rather fail as a mission executive 
then he, he was a director of a mission organization. I'd rather fail as a mission executive than as a father because my mission can get another director, but my kids can't get another dad. So he said, if I had to fail in one of them, I'd rather fail in this. He says, but I, I, I'm not sure that God is confused. I'm not sure that he went, oh, I forgot you had kids when I called you to be a mission director. Oh, that's right, you do have kids. What are we going to do with that? Or that he, he, when he gave me kids, he went, oh, shoot, you're, you're, that's right, you're a mission director. How are we going to accomplish that? He said, in God's mind, his, his desire is blessing for my family and my ministry. And so he said, how can I lead my ministry in such a way that actually my family benefits? We're going to talk about specific ways. So don't think about balancing family and ministry. Think about healthy family on mission. And how can, how can you work in such a way that your ministry blesses your family, your family blesses your ministry? And uh, that actually ties to another conversation that I had that was very significant to me. I was, uh, when I was, just had young kids, I was being discipled by a pastor who uh, just was an incredible model to me. And, uh, and I remember one of the walks that he took me on, we were, we were walking along and, and he's, how's your marriage, Dave? I, I, it's, it's fine. Yeah, well, how's your kids? Are you leading your wife? Are you leading your children? Well, yeah, I think it's fine. I said, Rich, why do you keep asking that stuff? Like, that's always where you start. And he said, because that is where we start. He said, uh, I'm asking this because I want you to be fruitful in ministry, and you're not going to be fruitful in ministry without a healthy family. So he says, I care about your, your, your ministry, but because I care about your ministry, I'm going to start with asking you about your family. And then he drew me a picture that was, that was just really interesting. He said, uh, my first... First concern is always with myself and others that you, you're like a spring and you have to, you have to fill up your spring with God. So your, your first, first question is, am, am I, is my relationship with God healthy? And he says, and then the next, next level you spill into is, is your marriage. So if you could picture this like a, you know, these, these are like circles. You spill into your marriage and then, and then that spills into a healthy family. And he says, if you'll care for those in that concentric way, if you'll care for your walk with God, your relationship with your wife, your kids, what happens is then, then this is the spill of water out into ministry and to people around you. It comes from a much, much bigger source. So you're, you're, you're sp spilling like that. He says, actually, you will accomplish much more in ministry by caring for your walk with God, caring for a healthy marriage, caring for your kids. And then from that overflowing well, spilling out into the lives of others. He said, you'll spill on this huge front like this. He says, but if you don't care for that, if you don't care for your walk with God, what's going to happen? The water's going to flow backwards, and you'll start borrowing off of the healthier marriage and borrowing off the healthier kids. If you don't have a healthy marriage, the same thing. It's hard to care for kids healthily without a healthy marriage. It'll start pulling water backwards. And the same, if, if, if these circles don't work, it actually creates a backflow and borrows, pulls back energy and blessing from, from the rest of our context. So he said, I, I don't care about your, I'm not thinking family or ministry. He says, I want you to have an impact and have a healthy family. And I believe that having a healthy family will cause you to have a greater impact. So you, you under, understand that, I think that's a false dichotomy I think we need to be thinking in, in ways that I don't actually want to sacrifice either of these. I don't want to sacrifice, and I'm particularly thinking mission, not ministry as in the organization you're running or the church you're running, but the mission, being on mission, living a life on mission with Christ, that you don't want to sacrifice that, um, and you want to have a healthy, healthy uh, family on the way. So, uh, okay, so how does that work practically? What do we do with that? And one of the things you see in the Bible is, you, it, it, it is there's, there's three rhythms for family on, on, on mission. Uh, basically, we are what we repeatedly do. And if we want to develop health and habits, if we want to develop health in our family, we're going to have to develop habits. If you, you can do something great, but if you just do it once, it's not going to have an effect. Uh, just, just like eating or exercise or anything that builds into our health, we, we have to have rhythms and repeated things we do. And there are three kinds of rhythms that Family on Mission has to develop. The first is daily connection with God as a, as a family. Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 21, as God is building into his bigger family of Israel the, the ability to pass this on, he says, 
You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall teach them th to your children, talking of them when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. How often do you sit in your house? How long do you, how often do you walk by the way? How often do you stand your right? These are daily habits. He's saying you have to work conversation about God into your daily rhythms. Conversation about God can't just happen once a week or once a month or every now and then. Uh, healthy families on mission actually talk about God every day in some form. That's just part of their, part of their daily rhythm. So one of the questions as you look at your families, is, is it part of our daily rhythm to at some part in the day talk about God together as a family? Here are, some, here are some particular ways you can do it. One of the things we did in our family is we prayed with each of our kids before they went to bed. And this was a particular responsibility my wife Connie took. Uh, sometimes I wasn't able to, sometimes I was on the road, but for 20 some years, every single night, she made the rounds into the kids. They were all in one room at the beginning and then they were in different rooms. And she would make the rounds and the last thing she would do with each one of our kids was pray with them before they went to sleep. And when I was there, I was often involved in that as well. What, what did that do? It gave a touch point every day to talk about God, talk about the day, and then to turn our attention to Him. And it was just one of those habits that kept, we're talking about God when we lay down. We're talking about God when we lay down. Uh, Claire, why don't you come up and just, what was it like for you to um, have mom come in every night? You know, why don't you take the mic and, um, and have that time of prayer with you. Yeah, um, I... You can do it a little it, lower. Yeah, yeah. It was a coveted time. I would look forward to this time with my mom at the end of the day because I knew that this was special time with mom. I could count on it. So if we didn't get to talking about something during the day, then at least we would get to it at night. And then we would talk about how the day went and we would pray for those specific things. So if I had a conflict with classmates at school, we would pray for that student. If I had a difficult time with my brothers, we would pray about that. If I needed to actually confess something or if I was scared about something that was coming the next day, then we would pray in advance for that. And so then when I went to bed, I was thinking about God. And I don't think I realized how big of an impact that had on my life until later on when I realized, wow, that is a huge gift that my mom gave us, not only for our relationship, but for my relationship with God too. Okay. And would you ever uh, talk about scripture or uh, principles from God's word? You were talking about how to deal with the problems. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's kind yes. of a yes or no answer. Yes. <laughs> once, I, once I got older, sometimes we would actually do kind of mom-daughter devotions together in the evenings as well. So once I had kind of more capacity to think about concepts, then we would work on those things together. And then she'd finish in your room and go to <laughs> Tyler's room. Yes. And Kayla's I was room. the youngest, so I was always first. You were always first. <laughs> and then go on. Yeah. And, and Tyler, can you tell, you have young kids now. How do you, how is your daily pattern of talking about God? Say something about that. Yeah. Yeah, so we have really young kids right now. We have a three and a half year old and an almost two year old. So we're just right at the beginning of all this. But yeah, I think from even in, like from the time they were starting to be interactive, it was it, like the daily rhythms were, were things we were thinking about. And so um, praying together at night, absolutely. And especially as our oldest is, is growing and learning to express things himself, um, actually guiding him and praying, like praying himself, or uh, at least asking him what uh, he, he wants like, to pray old, for. How old is he again? Three and a half. So praying at three and a half. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great. Sometimes, we'll, yeah, but we, almost every night we ask him, what would you like to pray for, Judah, tonight? And often he'll say, my church friends. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> okay. Great. So the, the, the daily rhythms, uh, pray with kids before they go to bed, a verse or short devotions at the dinner table. And again, you don't have to do all these. I'm giving you several possibilities. Uh, we, we actually didn't do this in our family, in our, but, but my parents did it. So I grew up in it, and then we kind of had, I, I don't know why we never did <laughs> Maybe we should have. But growing up, uh, my parents did it all the time. In fact, they still do. So I was, I was with my folks, and, and I was saying, yeah, they still do. I was with my folks about three, month, three months ago in Denver, sitting down at that. My dad's just turned 93. My mom's 
91, so they're still going. But I sit down at the table, we have breakfast table, and then we end, we ended that breakfast, and Dad pulls out the Bible, yep. mm -hmm. and we never leave the breakfast table without something from God's Word and praying. Never left the breakfast table without that. Now, when I was growing up, we never left the dinner table. Now it's, it's a breakfast table, but I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm not young anymore. He's not young anymore either. But if I'm at his table, we will open the Word of God at least once a day. And that's just one of those habits that, that builds something into you. I remember that, uh, that college president talking about um, having family devotions like this. And he was asked, um, do you remember much from those devotions? And he said, no, not really. He said, but it's kind of like pouring water through a sieve. Do you know what a sieve is? It's, it's, like, a, um, you know, it's like a strainer. He says, not much stays there, but the sieve gets cleaner. <laughs> and sometimes you're pouring the word of God through lives, and some of it they remember, and some of it they don't. But the word of God cleans us as, as we're in that daily contact. So that's the, that we're in just daily contact with the word of God that we do it when we stand up and sit down. Uh, last, last spring, my dad said, one of my dreams is before I die, I want to travel down the coast of Norway with my three boys. We're not boys anymore, but three young, <laughs> three old, old, uh, he still calls us boys, uh, and the mail ship. And so we said, dad, we'll do that with you. And so we, uh, this is us going down the coast of Norway. My other brother's taking the picture. And uh, here, here we are, seven days going down the coast of Norway. And what did my dad want to do every morning? He wants to have devotions together because he wouldn't want to spend time with his boys without spending time in the Word. And so this is us every morning with, you can see his Bible's there, and he said, I want to go through Titus with you. And so here's, this is, a, uh, this is actually, this makes me real emotional to see this picture of my dad's hand on the Word of God, because my dad's hand was often on the Word of God. He was a man of God's Word. And then his uh, notes right there, there we are, he's, he, we're, in, we're discussing Titus together. And uh, here's his grammatical layout of Titus. He's gone through the whole book and written it out and how the, how the lines go together. And he's got notes of study that he's done in his own devotions that just are part of his life. So he, he, my dad wasn't a professional, he wasn't a professional Christian. He, he was, it was every day, what, what I mean by that, that wasn't his job. It wasn't his job to be a Christian. It was his life to be a Christian. And so he was in the word, not yeah, not because he had to preach, but because he wanted to get to know God. He still does. And so this is one of, one of my just wonderful memories of those seven days with my dad is, is going through Titus together with all of us in the morning and just, what do you, what do you see in this passage? What's this here? Um, how These rhythms we have to build into our family. Memorizing scripture together. You memorize scripture together. We were just about two months ago, we visited this farm in Oregon. And this farm is interesting because on this farm are three generations of farmers who've su financially supported three generations of missionaries. So the, old, older, the oldest ones have supported my dad, the middle ones supported us, and the younger ones are supporting our kids. And we were, <laughs> we were which is really something. And these guys are family on mission. They're farmer family on mission, totally on mission. They pray for the world, they share their faith. And we were in this, this, this home with, there's just a simple home with farmers and their kids. And uh, here we are together. And uh, someone said something about a verse. And, and uh, mom said, well, why don't you quote, quote, the, quote the verse? And they started in. And the three of the kids, the one couldn't. But they started in on James. And halfway through the second chapter, we stopped. <laughs> I mean, they were, they're, they're memorizing the whole book of James. OK, look at their age right there. And then they had a couple Psalms that they memorized, and then part of Colossians, and they've got these big words that I go, you don't know what that word means yet, <laughs> but they can, they can say it. Uh, so uh, they're, they're going, these kids right here are soon going to have the whole book of James memorized. And how do they do it? Every night they work on it before they go to bed. It's just a pattern. Every evening we're in God's word and we're working on this. And, and uh, I actually have a video if you want to see it of them quoting the verse, but I couldn't get it up here and talking about what God is teaching you. So uh, that picture that I had from, um, from that breakfast was that visit to my, my parents not long ago. And I, I don't think I'm ever with my dad when he doesn't tell me something he's just learned from the Bible. So we're standing in his office and he goes, oh, Dave, oh, I was just reading in Timothy. 
And I saw something I've never seen before. Can I show that to you? And pretty soon he's got his Bible open. And he's, and he's talking about, he, he, it would, actually, I don't think, he's talking about some passage. That, I don't know where it was. It talks about the woman as a weaker vessel. It's actually Peter. And uh, he was saying, ah, God's really been convicting me of this. I just haven't been sensitive enough to your mom. So ask me next time when you're together, because this verse has really been convicting me. And we're standing in his office talking about that. That's one of the patterns of, of, uh, that my parents had, was talking about what God's teaching you in very open ways to your children, and that maintains that daily connection with God. So those are four ideas. You don't have to do them all. But my question would be, what is your daily rhythm, and do you have a daily rhythm? And it can be five minutes. It can be just, uh, do, you, do you have a habit, uh, a pattern, a tradition of connecting with God at least once every day? Okay, here's the next rhythm, a, a, rhythm, a weekly purposeful time with the entire family. And um, this has been, this was another key conversation I had when our kids were young. Uh, the wife of that pastor came and visited us, and she spent a week with us, and she says, I just have one piece of advice for you. She said, you need some time every week that's just focused on your family. She said, you plan everything else. You plan this meeting with your ministry team and this meeting with your staff. He, but he said, your kids need to know that there's some time that's set aside to them for them. And then you know they can count on it, and then that's your time to shepherd them. And so she said, you need to do a family night. And, and she said, it needs to be the same time every week, and it needs to be a time where you don't answer the phone, and you don't take any appointments, and you don't do any emails, and your kids know that that time is set aside. And she said, they'll actually have much more reserve for other interruptions if they know that that time is reserved for them and that they can count on it. So we made Thursday night our, our family nights, and we did family nights for 18 years, or maybe more. We did them for, it could have even been longer. We did them until Claire left for college. And um, here, here's what we did. We let life give us our curriculum. So we, sometimes it would just be fun. We would just uh, cook pizza and uh, mattresses. put out mattresses in the living room and do gymnastics. <laughs> and sometimes it was just fun. We tried to always have something where we were talking about God. But sometimes it was real serious. Sometimes we would say, hey, you guys were fighting a lot this week. We need to talk about fighting. Or, uh, wow, this is a hard time in school. We need to talk about what the Bible says about hard things. And I always thought, I'm going to run out of things to talk about. And life just kept giving us the curriculum. So I would always ask, what's going on in the family that I need to address this week? And then that would become our curriculum. Teach from the Word. We stayed creative. Sometimes we did some just super creative things and made it fun, special, meaningful. I would say that this, the decision to do a family night every week was just one of the key rhythms of our life. Now, it didn't happen I was gone sometimes, sometimes summer. We, it, it was not like four out of four, maybe three out of four. You don't do it perfectly, but uh, the fact that you keep working on that rhythm makes a real difference. And I wonder, uh, Claire, if you, could, if you could just come up and say something about how family nights were for you. And then we'll take a break. So you can hear that other people are arguing their break, so you're going to get your two. Well, I am definitely somebody who loves rhythm and order and patterns, so knowing that there was something I could depend on was particularly helpful for my personality, which was a huge service to me. But one thing that I loved that my parents did is they actually shared themselves with us. So sometimes my friends would ask me, well, what do you do? And what kinds of things do your parents teach you? And then I would tell them and they would say, oh, well, my parents could never do that. But that's the thing. My parents were actually just sharing who they were with us and what they cared about and what they loved. So my parents are both musicians, and so we would sometimes just have a whole evening of singing worship songs. Or uh, my dad taught us how to harmonize one day, and we, we learned public speaking one time because we all were terrible at it. And, <laughs> and my dad knew that because we had no practice in it in school, and so he actually sat us down and told us how we were supposed to do this. And they were things that my parents cared about. They, my dad taught us how to study the Bible, how to do a word study, an exegetical Bible study. And all of these things were just worked into our family patterns because that's who our parents were. And that was a huge gift to me that it wasn't just material, but it was actually who they were. 
Okay, great. Yeah, that was an interesting one. I, I, our, someone, some member of him, I gave testimony in church, and I was watching them. It was like this, and they were looking down and not looking in anybody's eyes. And I said, guys, we've got to work on this. And so for the next several weeks, we practiced public speaking in our living room. And so we would have one of them stand up. And I, so what, what are you supposed to do if you, sta- if you <laughs> speak for people? Well, <laughs> you taught us. That when you get up in front of people, you're supposed to plant your feet and then look people in the eye before you speak. And then you're supposed to follow the four Ps, which is pitch, pace, pause, and power. So you vary your pitch so that you're not just monotone all the time. You do pauses so that you don't just bulldoze people with information. (laughs) You let people think about it. You change the power of your voice, so sometimes you're calm and quiet, and sometimes you're excited and all out. And then the other one is, what am I missing? Pitch, pace, pace. So either talking slowly or, or quickly, and the, vary, the varying pace of that helps when people are listening. She still remembers. We didn't review before this talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the fun times I had was uh, Claire was, at, uh, was asked at the, um, at, when she graduated to speak for a group of 3,000 people. Mm-hmm. She was one of the speakers. That, and I was sitting in the audience going, I was nervous for her and everything like that. And she just did a great job. And I said, wow, that was great, Claire. She said, oh, I just thought of what you said. <laughs> Stand like, up in front. Oh, my goodness. So what we practiced in our living room <laughs> with just a small audience of four ended up being uh, for an audience of several thousand. So how, we need to equip our kids for, for the future. Let me just make you aware of a couple resources as we begin this next, next session. We have some books over here on the side that you might be interested in. One of them is called No Less Than Yes. It was written by my wife and just has stories from the last uh, 20, 30 years of ministry and uh, interesting stories also family on mission. So I think you'll, you'll enjoy that. Uh, I wrote a book called Father God, which is about how do you connect with God as father. And uh, this also has implications for your fathering. Those of you who are fathers, how do we pass on the father heart of God to others? So that's a resource. And then uh, Claire has just finished a study, uh, this deep dive study, which was a qualitative research study done with children of parents uh, who were missionaries and talking about what keeps a family healthy on mission. And there's lots of quotes from them and various findings. And actually this one, she's willing to give away. So that's real generous of her. The other two cost, <laughs> the other two cost 10 euros. Sorry about that. You're getting more generosity from my daughter. So <laughs> uh, these, are, these are all available if you're, if you're interested in getting those. Yeah. We're continuing this, these rhythms. We'll finish up these rhythms and then uh, we'll get Claire up here to talk about some of her findings from uh, other examples of how do we make this practical. So we've got this weekly and the one that I missed last time was share and pray together but also reg- regular engagements to, engagement together in, in service. So uh, how do we, so we have this daily rhythm, we have a weekly rhythm, and you can choose what you want to be the daily, what you want to be the weekly, but also how can you connect together and engage in service? Include them in what you're doing. So you saw some pictures of our family earlier on, and you saw some camps that we did, and, and our kids were right in the middle of it. And part of that is then they see uh, it's not that my parents leave to go and do ministry, but ministry is a great adventure we're doing together, and uh, they learn how to behave, <laughs> they learn how to build relationships, uh, they learn the names of people and know how to pray for them, and uh, that's just, just something for, we're, we're, we're on this together. So I, I tried to take our kids as many times as I was able, and Tyler, you've got small children now, can you just say anything about how you include your kids in on, in the in the mission. Yeah, so uh, this really started, especially when we were still back in the States, uh, raising support with uh, a uh, three-month-old and a year-and-a-half-old. We were we were in people's homes. We were in in restaurants, meeting with people, sharing about the the vision of our for our ministry and for what God's doing in this region. So that was a part of our life, a part of our family culture from a, a very early age. Now that we have a three-and-a-half-year-old and an almost two-year-old. Um, uh, they're a little bit more flexible, but they're still, they still require a, a lot of structure. Um, and my wife is, is very structure conscious. And so, um, so that requires, uh, but, but despite the structure, I think because we, um, we're conscious of structure during normal rhythms of life, that gives them a greater kind of bandwidth for when we have to take them and, and do something different. And so, um, 
for example, um, I led an internship program for uh, some Czech students uh, this last year, and one of the things that we did was took them on a missions trip to Albania. And uh, it would have been very easy to just leave the family at home and go on this missions trip and just be fully present with the interns. But we decided that it was actually be more beneficial for our family and also for the interns if we brought the whole family with us. And so um, we, we, yeah, it was, it was kind of crazy, but we brought them, or brought our two kids. My wife came as well. And uh, the feedback we got after the, the missions trip um, was uh, from one of the interns was that that was one of the most significant things from the whole week was actually seeing our family serve together, do life together, um, and just be in it together. And so I didn't mean that they were present at everything. Um, they were they spent the, the mornings uh, in our accommodating in our accommodation, but then when we were out with people, they were with us as well, and that was really significant. Um, another thing is like uh, just spending time with with church. It, our church family is really important that they are a part of that as well. Um, and like I said, my oldest son often prays for his church friends because he knows that they're, they're a part of our life. And, um, so that's, it's, yeah, we, they, we include them. We include, we try to include them wisely as well. Doesn't, Laura doesn't, my wife doesn't come to everything with me, but, um, but even she tries to be present uh, when I have a speaking engagement or, um, something of the like, even if all she does is, um, spend time with the children out in the hallway and then engages afterwards. That's that we see that as valuable too. So it doesn't have to always be a hundred percent, but there are creative ways for us to do this together and for my kids to see what, what we do. Okay. Great. Sometimes you might have to be creative about how you do this. When, uh, when I was growing up, my dad for a period of time was director of the mission organization. I told you that, but uh, we lived in Denver and he was responsible for missionaries all around the world. So a lot of his work was a long ways away. And he would sometimes uh, get in a plane and we wouldn't see him for two months because he would go and travel and visit all these missionaries and kind of stay out like thousands and thousands of kilometers away. And he was concerned about how this was going to affect the family. So uh, we said earlier, you have to you know, live out of who you are. He grew up on a farm. And so he made two very interesting decisions. One was he didn't travel at all during the summer. And we had this huge garden. Uh, we didn't own much land, but we found a lot of land around us that wasn't, people were having to keep the weeds down, you know, it was building property that no one could build on. And he said, I'll keep your weeds down if you'll let me grow vegetables on your land. And pretty soon we were, we were gardening uh, over a hectare of, of land uh, and, and raising vegetables with this little rototiller. And uh, we found out that we had many, much more vegetables than we needed and began to sell it from our back porch. And we lived in the city, but we put out a sign and then I'd go out there and, and sell, these, sell these vegetables. And, uh, and my dad got this idea, what if we, if we do this even more purposefully and then use the money so that one of the kids can travel with, with me? So uh, we would work hard all summer selling vegetables, and then every one of us got to travel with my dad once on one of his long, long trips, paid for by the work of the family. So when I was 12 years old, right after Christmas, I got a, on a plane with my dad, um, and at that time, no one did traveled like this. But I got on a plane with my dad, and we flew from Denver to <coughs> L.A., and then to Japan, and then to Taiwan and Thailand. And we went the whole way around the world. So we came back the other side. And uh, for three months, I traveled with my dad. Now, he was working. He was ministering in all those places. But that time together with him was just hugely significant for me. It was really my missions internship at 12 years old. And uh, he said, I'm going to talk to you about what's going on. I'll let you in on things. You're going to see what it's like to, uh, to be in all these different places. I even memorized some of his sermons because he did the same one over and over again. <laughs> so I memorized it and learned how to preach it. <laughs> but uh, that three-month time with my dad when I was 12 years old, can, you can just imagine how impacting that was for me. It took a lot of creativity for him to pull that off. And so to be thinking about what are maybe some creative ways, how can you do things that uh, maybe you don't have money? Is there a way to generate money by doing something with a family? Is there, is, are there creative uh, solutions? And uh, that's one of the things I've done with, with our kids is, is taking them with me traveling. And it was actually uh, Tyler took a trip to Israel with me when he was a teenager, which sparked his love for the Old Testament and sent him um, off to Bible college and then to an Old Testament degree. So it was really that trip that, that sparked that in him. So how can you include them in what you're doing? Think of creative ways to serve together. Uh, one of the things that my parents did when we were, we went on vacation once when we were teenagers, and my dad said, how about if we 
uh, find a country church and do a vacation Bible school for them. A vacation Bible school is a week-long children's program. And so we found this little country church, and we did an entire week of children's program, just our family. We were the entire program. And that's what we did for half of our vacation. Well, it was, it was just really an int- it was a great experience together. So we had to divide it up and, and, and learn how to work. Uh, how, can you, how can you do that together to serve together? One of the things we did in our, our family nights as our kids got to be teenagers is we started talking about evangelism together, how, how to pray for our friends. And we made up a list of 10 most wanted, uh, 10 people that we were praying for together as a family. And part of our family nights was praying for them and talking about what we could do with, with them. And then we practiced how, sharing our faith. How do you share? We did that in our living room. Uh, and Claire, why don't you, I don't know if you could say, I didn't tell you about this, but you're, the one you were praying for was Christy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, can you just say something about that time and how you learned to share your faith and you know, what happened with that? My dad has the gift of evangelism, and I do not. <laughs> but I'm really grateful that he shared what it means to share your faith, because for me, it was, it was kind of something scary. And I was in my first year of high school, and I had a seatmate. Her name was Christy, and she was not a believer. And so she was on, my, on our list. She was one of the 10 that we were praying for. And I knew that I was praying for her, but I knew also that it, it involved sharing my faith with her as well. And because I was a little bit scared to do this, and because she was kind of a quiet person too, I actually decided to write a letter to her and give it to her as a Christmas gift. And in the letter, I explained how much I cared about her and explained the gospel as well. And something that's really cool that happened is that a year later, we were at a camp together, and we got to pray, and she received Christ, which was really sweet. And then I got to be her maid of honor at her wedding last year. That was really sweet, too. <laughs> yeah, praise God. Awesome. Uh, find the spiritual gifts and develop them. You, you just heard that Claire said she doesn't have the gift of evangelism. One of the things I discovered is that she has a gift of hospitality, which, um, which my parents have and I don't have, and was pretty exciting to find. She would, we would have people over at our house, and she would go, that was so much fun, Dad. Why don't you invite people over more often? <laughs> and uh, and I said, I said, well, it's because it's a lot of work. And she said, well, could I bake for them? Could I prepare? And I found out that Claire actually loves to cook and bake and, and open the home. So we started going, okay, we're going to invite some people over. And Claire, you're in charge of hospitality. And she would just really enjoy that. Uh, so uh, how do we find those gifts and, and really uh, let them loose? Watch for things that grab their heart and pursue them. And uh, so they're, they're, then they may be different than what grabbed your heart. So uh, how do you watch for that and see what, where are they really resonating? Uh, I can, uh, yeah, uh, Claire's an artist. Um, I'm more into music. Neither Connie and I can draw, but wow, she really enjoyed that. So how do we follow that? Uh, Tyler got interested in guitar when he was in his teenage years. And so we said, how can we get him a guitar and help him, help him learn? And now he's a worship leader today. So what do we, how do we find the things that grab their heart? And, and pursue them, and then keep it varied and interesting. So make it all an adventure. Actually, let me just do that right now then, because uh, I was gonna pass this on, but maybe this is a good, four thieves of family mission, mission to make a good impression. And sometimes what happens is uh, parents wanna be on mission so that everyone else is impressed with their family. And the kids feel that in a moment. They feel that in a heartbeat. And so it's very important that as we're family on mission, we're not doing that to impress people with what a great family we are. We're always trying to draw attention to God and to his, um, and to his, uh, his, his mission. Uh, another mission to validate mom and dad. And sometimes we're thinking, uh, well, I don't know how good we are, but our kids are going to be great. You know, we're, we're not real talented, but if our kids get it, then they'll, the, and, and parents often will start to live through their children. And the, and the kids feel that pressure. They feel like, well, wait, am I living my life or am I living yours? Is this, is this for you or is this for me? And we have to just keep asking the question, you know, what's, am, am I doing this for God and for my kids or am I doing this just for myself? Mission to clone the parents. And uh, sometimes parents go, success will be that you end up looking just like me. And I have several friends who grew up in ministry families and, and they say, uh, one of them said, my dad didn't recognize that I was different than he was. 
And, and so he was always trying to, he'd been successful in ministry, he was always trying to make me just a smaller version of himself. And uh, he said he didn't really understand me. And his, that son felt that as just tremendous pressure. And it was kind of causing him to push, push off. And mission that's controlled and owned rather than stewarded and received. And it's important as we're talking about family on mission, there's sometimes some subtle differences. Uh, we said God's rescue mission is a family business, but it's his family business. It, we, we don't own it. Uh, and so sometimes people have ministries that they almost make like family businesses that the family owns. Do you know any churches like this? We're working, dealing with a couple of churches right now. There's one church that um, we're, we're working with in Ukraine that has, there's a bunch of problems going on because the founder of the church, uh, the, the building's actually in his name, and, um, and all of his kids are on staff, and he wants to turn it over to his son. And, uh, but it's, it's almost like, hey, I founded this church, which belongs to me, and I'm going to pass it on to my kids. And, and then it, it becomes like, I don't know, like a mafia, like a family mafia. Everyone's going, wait, wait, what, who, who does this belong to? And so sometimes people carry it so far that the church becomes a place that their kids can be employed and uh, they get preferential treatment. And we just, we have, to, we have to watch that. The family business doesn't belong to the family, it belongs to the father and uh, it belongs to him. It's not controlled by our families, it's controlled by him. And as we serve with a, with a family, we, we always need to, to serve within what he's doing and not be owning. Uh, and when it's, when it's controlled and owned, it can actually be very unpleasant for other people. What does it look like to have family on mission from the kid's perspective? And what are some habits that you can incorporate into your own family life that are very supported by kids? So these are actually all part of what we did for the deep dive as well. A lot of these points that are going to be talked about are actually things that kids said were valuable to them and adults said were valuable to them when they were growing up as JV kids and as missionary kids. But first, I would love to start with a verse that you might know very, very well. This was actually a verse that my mom would sing to us when we were kids. I, we have a cassette tape that we can play at home of my mom singing this verse. So it was very, it was very well known to me as a kid. Proverbs 22.6, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Maybe, do you remember? No? <laughs> If you, if you come to me afterwards, I'll sing it for you. <laughs> How about that? So I went off to Bible school when I graduated from Czech high school, and I studied educational ministries and Bible. And at one point during my studies, we talked about this verse. And I remember it was the first time I actually heard anybody explain what this verse is really about. Because it was in me, but I didn't really know what the context of it was. So growing up, I kind of took this as a promise, you know? If you train up your child in the way that they should go, in the way that God designs, then that means when they're old, they're not, they won't depart from it, right? I mean, great. But then I had friends who would say, oh yeah, well, but I know families who grew up in great, in, in, I know kids who grew up in great families and decided not to follow God, so what do you do with that? And I never really knew how to answer that question because I still thought, well, this verse, based on this verse, it, that shouldn't happen. So surely there must have been some mistake that the parents did. But then in Bible school, we talked about how there are different types of literature in the Bible, and Proverbs is part of wisdom literature. And wisdom is God's design for how creation should look like in its ideal state. What, what is God's design for, for us, for families, for people? What does it mean to have the good life? What does the best life look like? That's what Proverbs is about. But what I didn't know is that there's also Job and Ecclesiastes, which are basically about what do you do when it all goes wrong? <laughs> because there, there, are, there are wise sayings that give us guidance for life, but there's also life and sin and decay and evil that can affect things too and can make something really good be twisted. So Proverbs is wisdom, not promise. It's a proverb, not a promise. 
But that doesn't mean that it's not good. So actually, this is, this is the starting point for us, the starting point for seeking the good life as a family. This is, what it, this is where we start. But that's not to say if, if it doesn't turn out, God's not like, oops, sorry, sorry that didn't work out for you. He actually, he knows what it means to lament. He knows, Tyler talked about, he knows what heartbreak means, and that's okay f- with him too. And that's why we have Job and Ecclesiastes. So I'm grateful for that. But I wanted to give you guys that framework because we're going to talk about seven habits of family on mission. And it's kind of like this proverb where it's actually, it's a habit that you can build into your family, but it's not a promise that everything will go great, but it is, it is a good place to start and a good, a good habit to build into your family. So are you ready? Let's go. Seven habits of family on mission. The first one is authenticity. One of the questions that I get most often is, what's it like being Dave and Connie's daughter? Which I never really know how I'm supposed to answer because I feel like something's behind that question and I don't know what you're actually asking. But I love that one of the answers that I can give to that question is that my parents are the same outside as they are inside. So what you see on the outside, what you see in their ministry, that's what I experienced at home too. And that's one of the greatest gifts that you can give to your kids too, is that the same effort and love and Christ-loving nature that you give to everybody else is what you give at home too. And like my dad said earlier, kids will sniff you out in an instant if if you are not authentic at home and outside of the home. Uh, one of the ways that my parents did this was actually when we were visiting supporters, we were very open before and after about what the experience was like. So I, I coined it, we briefed and debriefed. So beforehand, my parents would talk to us and tell us what to expect, what kinds of problems we might encounter, what we might be feeling. They would ask us questions. And then afterwards, we would talk about what was that experience like? How did you feel? What was difficult? What was great? What did you learn? And that really helped us open up conversations that made it easy to be authentic, even with supporters. So we knew that that was never something that was pretend, but we would actually talk about it together as a family. One JV kid, so kids, a kid of missionaries in Josiah Venture said, I learned from my parents and the JV community the value of being open and honest with others. I have carried that over to the way I lived my life in college with others and now in my job. I seek to openly communicate and resolve conflict in all my relationships. So the authenticity that you build at home will have impact into their life outside of the home as well. The next point is conversation about mission. We've already talked about this a little bit, but talk about it all the time. Explain to your kids what it means to actually be family on mission. If you talk about that term, they'll start to wonder, what are you talking about? What does that mean? And a lot of times kids get asked the question, what does your parent do? What, like, what's their job? And you can actually help equip them to answer that question in a way that talks about family on mission, not just, oh, my dad teaches on Sundays, or my dad works with students at schools, but to actually use it as an opportunity to share about who God is and about what we care about. And that will give them a lot of comfort, too, to know, how am I supposed to talk about this? But also, it will give you family identity as well, to know, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is what it means to be a Christian and a family. The next one is learning by doing. One of the big blessings that you have to give to your kids is place. And if you read my dad's book, then that's one of the big things that God gives us as a father as well is place. And this is something that you can give to your kids as well. It's actually that as you are doing ministry, you're inviting them in and teaching them things along the way. So that can be anything. And some of the JV kids said, as kids of missionaries, we get to take on different leadership roles that others wouldn't have a chance to do because our parents do it. We can help our parents with youth group and with our music ministry. Another kid said, because I was part of my parents' ministry, I learned that I am key to JV and to God's kingdom. I have purpose and can be part of what God is doing, which is so cool. I love that a kid is already recognizing, 
I have a place in this, and I, and I know that because I'm doing it together with my family already. Our next one is equipping for mission. That's very closely tied to learning by doing. And one of the things that we learned from doing the JV Kid research, the, the research with these kids, is that sometimes they can feel a pressure to perform. Like, I, I have to be good enough to do this. Or there's a need, so I'm the one who needs to step into this, whether I want to or not. Or my parents want me to be somewhere, but I don't really want to be there. And some of that is tied actually with their own sense of identity in the midst of all that's happening. So when we say equipping for mission, we're not just equipping for things that they're doing, like, oh, you should, you should learn how to play the guitar, or you should learn hospitality. But it's actually shaping who they are and what they believe about God and about mission as well. But part of that, so part of that is, is saying it's more important that they're doing things for God, not just that they're doing things. Uh, but, so talking about their love for God being most important. But you also can teach them practical skills too. So are they, are, do you see in your kids that they're gifted with details? Teach them how to use Excel and how to actually like budget for a mission, ministry event. That's awesome. If you see that they're natural learners, teach them how to study the Bible or how to, to, how to prepare a sermon. I remember my dad told me, yeah, you can look at my Bible commentaries anytime. Why don't you just take one and you can read it before you go to bed? And I was so excited. I was so happy. And I actually kept it on my bedside table for months and months. Couldn't find my commentary. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't find it. Um, if you can see that your kids are natural encouragers, they just bring life and joy to, to everyone they meet, buy them a stack of cards and teach them how to write letters to people. Give them addresses so that they can actually write encouraging notes to people. Or are they evangelists? Maybe they actually have the gift of evangelism and you can teach them how to better hone their skills as evangelists. So what are some, some different ways that they could share the gospel? Or maybe you can go with them and practice sharing the gospel. So look for those places where you already see that they're gifted and then equip them in those ways. Yeah, we already talked about Second Timothy, but fan into flame the gifts that they've been given. So part of that gift is actually being in a family where those things can be fanned into flame. So fan them into flame when you see them. Kids will actually feel really seen and valued when you point out something that they're strong in and can help them develop it in Christ, with the strength of Christ. The next one is sacrifice and service as privilege. And this is a really interesting one because it might not be obvious at first, and you might think, well, how would kids ever see something like sacrifice as, as something that's good? But I want to read a couple of quotes from our kids who have learned from their parents what it means to see difficulty as something good. One kid said, to really know God, you have to have gone through something. You have to suffer and need him. My family encourages going to God during suffering, so your relationship with God becomes stronger because of that. This is like a 14-year-old saying this. Another, another kid said, difficulties help me grow in dependence on Christ instead of fearing, relying on God's strength instead of my own. Another kid expressed this in a different way. He said, I was always different than everyone else. My name was different. My dad was super outgoing. My culture was different, and I spoke English. I had a different looking house. So being different is not uncomfortable. The fact that I'm different in faith or values isn't something I'm shy about. So actually, the discomfort of being different was something that they learned to be thankful for because it gave them even more freedom to be honest and open about their faith too. So how can you do this? How can you actually foster this in your kids where they see sacrifice and service as a privilege. One of the ways that you can do this is by giving them empathy when they are experiencing pain, but then also not leaving them powerless in it. So when you are talking with them and they're experiencing something really hard, like pressure from the surrounding environment, or maybe in school somebody's making fun of them because of their faith or because their parents don't work in a normal job, one of the ways that you can 
support them is by saying, yeah, I get that, and that's really hard. Can you tell me more about that? But then also saying, okay, this is true. We can't change this, but what can we do? What can we change? Maybe we can change some of the ways that you talk to your friends, or maybe we can actually pray for those people who are hurting you, or maybe there's somebody that you need to forgive. So giving them, giving them steps to move forward in it after you've already shown empathy. You can also identify the character that God is building in them through those difficulties. So when they see that sacrifice is actually something that Jesus does, and that they're being like Jesus when they experience something that's hard, and that this is building in them a character that looks like Jesus, and that that's really valuable. Uh, one of the things that I love to teach kids is the, the picture of, a, of how a diamond is formed. It's formed with lots of pressure and lots of heat. And they, they get that. They understand what pressure and heat feels like when they live family on mission. But I love then telling them, like, look at these verses. Look, there's so many verses about how actually suffering brings, brings blessing and suffering brings closeness to Christ, just like how a diamond is formed. Then you get to see something really precious. One of the practical ways that you can actually even celebrate this is Every New Year's, for as long as we can, I can remember, we've gathered as a family and we have talked about what's happened in the years past and actually celebrated the ways that we've seen each other grown. So we, we focus on one person and we say, here's how I've really seen you grow, grow in this past year. And I've really seen God do this in your life. And, and I, I saw you step up to this challenge and I really admire that in you. And so we have this, this memory of all of these years of saying, Wow, God has been faithful here, and God is growing you here. And it gives you courage to step into the next year as well. The last one is emotional availability. I'm sure you all have times when you are totally done with people and you don't feel like talking to your kids or, or talking to anybody. Uh, but there, there needs to be emotional availability at home just as much as there is outside the home. So even if that means just taking time once a day where you express, I'm here, I'm listening, I'm ready to hear what you have to say. Um, one, of, one of the things that my mom actually did when we were kids is she would pick us up from school every single day, even when we were teenagers, because she wanted to be the one to hear things at the first moment when we were done from school. And as we were teenagers, we would be like, Mom, <laughs> Should we like walk home? It's only like 25 minutes. I don't know. It's not that far. All of our friends are walking. Mm -hmm. And I remember she told us, well, actually, I love picking you up because then I get to be the first one to hear what's happening in your day, and I want to be there for you. And so then we were like, oh, well, in that case, it's really cool to be picked up by mom. <laughs> and sometimes our friends would ask us, why does your mom pick you up? And we'd say, because she loves us, because <laughs> she wants to talk with us. And having that emotional availability from my mom and then knowing when, when I could talk with my dad, too, whether that was at the end of the day or during our family nights, was really valuable and is valuable for our kids as well. Oh, I have one more, last one, celebration. Don't forget what the Lord has done. Celebrate it. God says so many times in the Old Testament and the New Testament, remember, 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 don't forget. So that's one way that you can actually equip your kids to love being family on mission is to celebrate the victories and celebrate times where you failed and God provided anyways. Um, one of our kids said, when I was a kid, we got four words that described each of us by our teammates and our parents, and this was crucial. So they were together at an event, and each of the parents and leaders said, these are four words that I see describe who you are, and this is really amazing and beautiful. She said, I also grew through music school, which is really scary. My parents spoke into that and pointed me to God about my identity and talent in this. So she had some talent in music school, but it was really hard, and her parents spoke into that and said, look what God is doing. And they would celebrate at different events and actually see what God was doing. And that moved them forward to love being family on mission as well. So those are the seven habits of family on mission that you can start with and then build on that list from there.
Uh, now, one of the things we're telling these stories, you can, you can tell a lot of good stories and it starts to look like everything's great and everything's going well, uh, but families on mission have lots of problems. Uh, they do, and your family on mission will have lots of problems, and, and uh, one of the questions is how do you deal with them? You, you, when they come, you might say, what am I doing wrong, that there are problems, but it's normal to have problems. Look at all the families that we see in the Bible, even God's family. Uh, they're, we're sinful. We have problems. So how do you deal with them? And he, here's one thing is move toward the problem. You won't always know how to solve it. You'll often feel bad that it's there, but actually moving in the direction towards the problem makes a difference. And those steps of faith can actually uh, help, help to, to solve it. So often as you engage in a problem, you engage without knowing how you're going to solve it. Even sometimes maybe fearful that you're not going to. And uh, so we're going to tell some problem stories. So Tyler, why don't you come up here? And uh, when, when uh, you and your brother oh, yeah. were growing up, Caleb, uh, you, you had some challenges in your relationship, didn't you? Could you just yeah, say so, something about that? So my brother Caleb, who is two and a half years younger than I am, and I'm the firstborn, but he always wanted to be the firstborn. I think that runs in the family because dad is second born and he always wanted to be first born as well. Um, but this, but um, we just had so many issues growing up. Um, so many issues. We, um, uh, Caleb was always uh, physically stronger than me so he could beat me up. Uh, but I knew just what to say to tear him down and to make him feel really bad about himself. Um, and um, and we had, there was a lot of like territorialism, like this is my space, you're not allowed here. And so like, um, I had some friends when I was probably eight and nine, and uh, Dad was helping us build a treehouse, um, and uh, and uh, and I just I wouldn't let my brother be a part of that with me, <laughs> and uh, and I wouldn't let him be friends with my friends as well, and so it just kind of pushed him out, and so um, it, it it just as continued getting worse and worse, and uh, and we didn't really my parents didn't really know what to do about it like they tried a bunch of stuff it, it didn't work and then we got to about 15 or 6 when i was 15 or 16 which is a long time to still be having sibling problems um and uh and i remember uh, me and my brother getting in a fight uh with my brother's friend who was there and my mom just had enough and and she said we're going to solve this right now. <laughs> and she said, Noah, you go over there and we're, we're going over here. Like she sent uh, my, my brother's friend somewhere else. Like he was over for a play, like to play. And she said, you got to go somewhere else right now because we're going to deal with our problems. Um, and so we went into my brother's room and she, we, she locked us in there, the locked the door and said, um, I believe that this is not just a, a, a relational issue between you, but I believe this is there's something spiritual going on that we need to fight because I believe that that God wants um, you to have a strong and loving relationship between you guys, and God wants to actually use your relationship to bless many people and to to build His kingdom. And the enemy doesn't want that, and so he's doing everything he can to tear you apart. And so we're just going to spend some time praying. My mom is a, is a prayer warrior, and so she knew we just got to we gotta move toward the problem. And I remember thinking in my head, I don't want this. I don't want to move toward the problem. I actually don't really uh, want to have a relationship with my brother because he, I don't really like him. He's really different than me. I don't understand him. He doesn't understand me. And so actually, I really don't want this. Um, and I could tell that Caleb felt the same way <laughs> as we're sitting on, in, on the floor in, our, in, in Caleb's bedroom. And we're just both like, nope, nope, we don't want this. Mm -mm, nope. Um, but my mom led us through uh, to uh, help us confess that as well and say, like, we don't want this. But, uh, and she helped us confess it and actually ask God for forgiveness. And, and, and in that moment of asking for forgiveness, God started tearing down the walls between us. Um, and, uh, and there wasn't an immediate change, but slowly God started healing those wounds now that he had a space to work. Um, and, uh, and now I can say that my brother's my best, one of my best friends. Like we, um, we, what? Glory to God. Glory to God. Absolutely. It, and, and, and my mom was right. God wanted to use our friendship, our, our brother relationship for his glory. Um, we, we ended up uh, at the same university. 
um, overlapping for one year, and I was one of the, the worship leaders for the school, and I got to invite my brother to join my worship team, and so we got to lead worship in front of a th a thousands of, of university students together, and then um, and then we've uh, we've taught together on various occasions, and I just love preparing Bible lessons with him because we think of different things, we we tackle the issue from different different uh, angles. And so, for example, when we took the interns to Albania um, to, to, to work with my brother um, a couple months ago, we prepared a teaching together and we just had so much fun. We stayed up till midnight just talking about, oh, it'd be great to talk about this and this and we could talk about it from this angle. And then the next morning we, we presented it to the interns and it was, it was so much richer because we worked on it together. And um, it, we still have problems too. We still have things we have to overcome. We, uh, we, we led worship again together uh, recently at one of our Josiah Venture conferences, and uh, we had some conflicts we needed to deal with. Um, we, we still are both kind of territorial, and, and we both want to be the, f the, the best, we want to both be the firstborns, and we had to have a conversation at one point of saying, I'm sorry that, uh, that, that he actually had to apologize to, to me for, um, for having a bad attitude about, about something, and, and I apologize to him for, for not giving him enough space to, to use his gifts. So it's an ongoing process, but I'm so grateful that we moved toward the problem those ma that many years ago um, after not knowing what to do for a long time, moving toward the problem and, and opening it up so that God could do a miracle. All right. Praise God. Yeah, like you said, praise God. <laughs> um, yeah, you really have to, we have to fight for your relationships. They, they, they don't, uh, they're, they're under attack. And I remember a time, Claire, why don't you come up, when um, Claire was... Um, uh, I, I understood how to relate to Claire until she became a teenager, and then I just got lost. Um, I, I knew more how to connect with the, the boys because we could go on a hike together or snowboard or something like this, but all of a sudden I had a, a, a young lady in my home, and I was just a little lost about how to relate, and she was different than, you know, she was a teenager, she thought differently, and so, uh, so I could sense that there was distance coming up, and, and so I started trying to, to break through it, and uh, I... I would walk past the room and, and the door would be open a little bit and, and I'd, I'd poke in and I'd say, uh, what, what are you working on, Claire? You know, what's, what's, what's going on? And, um, and she would just kind of glare at me and nothing and, you know, look back and, <laughs> and I'm going, I'm trying, I'm trying to reach out for it to her and, and it's just, you know, bouncing off. And finally, uh, my, my wife said, Dave, you and Claire are missing and she needs to talk to you about you're you're not coming across like you think you're coming across. <laughs> and so, Claire, how was this for you um, when we were in the middle of that? I for sure have a tendency to feel pressure to perform. That's just part of my personality. And so when my dad would come in and ask me, what are you doing? I felt like I had to justify myself. Like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, dad. <laughs> like, and I, when I'm asking, just so you know, <laughs> when, when I'm asking the question, I'm thinking, I want to start a conversation. Yeah. And that's the easiest starting point. You know, I'm working on my homework or something like that. I mean, that's where I would start. Guys talk about what they're doing, right? So that's, that's, so that's what it's, Right, right. So. Well, I, I felt threatened by my dad. <laughs> and I, I felt like I had to tell him, like, I'm using my time well, I promise. I'm working hard at school. You don't have to check in on me. I'm responsible. Why do you think I'm irresponsible? <laughs> and I didn't. I was just trying to start a conversation. And but you can see how easy misunderstandings can happen. And even with the best intent, I want a relationship, she wants a relationship, and we're missing each other. And actually, I'm feeling a little hurt because she's not interested in really talking to me. And she's going, Dad's just, well, you thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking Dad just cares about what I'm not doing, not about who I am. So that was the impression that I had. So this could have been really bad. Like if we had just left that, uh, that impression might have uh, settled in with her that this is the way Dad views me. And my impression of my daughter really now doesn't really want to be close to me. So I'll just let her be close to mom. They're two girls. They know how to do this. Um, you know, and I'll be close to the boys, uh, which, which could have happened. And I think what, one of the things that was great, one is that my wife got involved. She said, you guys got to talk <laughs> because you're not understanding each other. And then what my wife's best friend uh, d does some work on helping dads connect with their daughters, which is particularly teenage daughters. That can be a challenge. And so she told Claire to, um, she gave her a list of questions that she was supposed to answer and then meet with me and tell me the answers to those questions. 
So I find out that Claire's filling out questions about our relationship and we're going to meet together. Now we get into these, these male-female issues because I'm going, oh, I'm going to find out all the things I'm failing as a dad. You know, I'm going to get a report card and my daughter's going to tell me, you're doing this and I'm disappointed. I did not want to have that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see how easy you can, you can just start missing each other? Uh, but go ahead. What happened next? Yeah. So actually, uh, I, this friend was doing research at that time. So she was just gaining answers to her questions. And when she read my answers, she said, you should tell these to your dad. He should know about this. So then I was terrified because I was like, no, I was honest. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't let my dad see these answers. He wasn't supposed to see these answers. <laughs> so I, it, was, it was terrifying for me to think that my dad could actually know what I was thinking and feeling. And I didn't, I didn't want to share that because it, I felt like I don't actually want to hurt him. Uh, so it was, it was very scary. I didn't have the courage, for, for both of us, I didn't have the courage to say it out loud. So I used the method of Christy and just gave him the piece of paper <laughs> and said, uh, Dad, here's some things you might want to know. I don't really want to share these things with you, but I feel like it's important because I feel like we're not really connecting these days. And so he just sat there and read through the paper. And then I remember at the end, him just looking at me and saying, I'm really sorry, I, I didn't know. I didn't know that that's what you were experiencing. So he said, I want to fix it. I really care about you. How can we fix this? Um, so, and that, those, are, those are not fun times. Why don't you step here just for a second? Because also in that, in that moment, I have to work through my defensiveness and, you know, and, and not go, well, wait, wait, you don't understand. No, I'm really... And, and, and say, I'm sorry. And that's, um, would you forgive me? And I wanna be close to you and I'm sorry I've been missing. Now I had to actually say, okay, I do, I do wanna start a conversation with you. Can you tell me the words that I'm supposed to say? So I actually, I actually asked her to give me the script. I said, okay, if I walk past your room and the door's open and I want to say hi, what should I say? Cause I don't know. And, <laughs> and she said, I said, it would be great if you asked me, how are you feeling today? <laughs> how are you feeling today? Guys, we don't, we don't understand those kinds of things, right? But I actually had to get a script from her. And so I come up to the door, I'd open up, and I'd get, how are you feeling today? <laughs> Did I get it right? <laughs> and then we would, we would start in with some good conversation. Yeah. So uh, I would say it's still something we have to work on. Like, even now, as, as I'm an adult too, like we still have to continue to engage in how to actually communicate in a way that we both will understand each other. So we still have conversations where it's like, I think we missed each other. I'm sorry, will you forgive? Uh, I don't know, we need to figure this out. And one of the things I really appreciate about, about Claire and the, and the kids is, is that, uh, and she just did this week, she said, Dad, I need some time with you before we, before we run into this. And I just really appreciate that initiative. And that initiative back and forth, uh, and sometimes saying, this is what I need from you, you're giving me this, I need something else, uh, is just re is really precious. You're, you're gonna have problems, you're gonna miss each other. And so just kind of that grace to, to be able to talk and say, uh, I don't think you're understanding, and the openness to receive that is just really helpful. So thanks for being honest. And I don't know. I, I, you know, this, I don't need this, do I? <laughs> actually, actually, that that piece of paper, I read it, and I don't think I've read it since then because, I, you know, those things. It's hard to find out what you're not doing well, and uh, but we have to move towards the problem, and uh, and and face it, even when it's not pleasant. Here's another one: pursue Jesus, not the perfect family. It's not about being a perfect family. It's about being on mission with Jesus and about pursuing Jesus. And, and sometimes the imperfections actually are huge opportunities to experience the gospel. So to give and receive forgiveness, to, exercise, to, uh, to receive and give grace, uh, to recognize that, that it's because of, Jesus is great. That's why we have salvation, not because we're great. And so the, uh, those imperfections give great opportunities for the gospel. And, uh, and actually some of my, my strongest memories, one, I have a super strong memory of when I was about 13 and I was in a fight with my dad and we were arguing back and forth and, um, and I got teenage upset, you know, how that's like. And I went out and I slammed the door and I walked downstairs and I laid down on my bed and I was just mad at my dad. And in a few minutes I heard a knock on my door and then he came in and he sat down on my bed and he said, Dave, can we talk? 
I guess. I mean, I didn't have any choice. I mean, the <laughs> house belonged to him, so I can't really keep him out. I did not want to talk to my dad. And, uh, and he, said, he said, Dave, uh, uh, I, uh, I respond in anger up there. Would you please forgive me? And really, I think I was the one that was wrong. But his step of, of self-reflection and, and then reaching out, it just, it meant so much to me. And then he said, he said, um, I, um, I love you very much as, as my son, and my relationship with you is, is so important to me. I don't want anything to come in the way. And so I just, if something does, please tell me, because I, I want our relationship to be open. And that kind of vulnerability, I care about you, I care about this relationship, I'm willing to be the first that apologizes, just meant so much to me. I mean, in some ways, it meant more to me than if he had been a perfect dad. That makes sense? That's the gospel. So we don't give our kids perfect parents, but we, we, want, we want to live in the gospel in that, that we're all pursuing Jesus. And so what they experience when they experience our imperfections is they experience Christ, and they experience our willingness to, to go to Jesus and let him be enough. And parent on behalf of, of the Father. So uh, this, this also is an is a important concept for me, is that actually your kids don't belong to you. And, and even though you think you made your kids, you didn't. Uh, God really made them. And they, uh, they're, they're his creation, and they're, they've been given to you as a stewardship. And it, it's really important to recognize that I am stewarding God's kids for him, and also that in the end, I don't just want them to be attached to me. I want them to be attached to their, their Heavenly Father and understand being part of his family. It really changes how you parent. Because then you're thinking not just how do I get my kids in order, but how do I, how do I reflect God's heart towards his kids? That, that my kids have another father, and I need to be reflecting his father heart towards them. And thinking about how does God treat his kids? I need to treat my kids the same way. How does God see my kids? And I need to see them the same way. And then I'm actually reflecting the, the father heart of God, which is what one of those books is about if you, if you want to read more about it. Uh, that has been just a, a huge help to me in, in, uh, in thinking how do I, and, and the other thing is, I'm not going to meet all their needs, so part of my, my purpose is to get them attached to their Heavenly Father. Not just, I'm going to be the perfect father that's going to meet their needs, but even in times where I disappoint them to say, you know what, I'm doing my best, I'm just, I'm still not as good as your father. And so we both have got to go to him to make sure we're getting from him everything that that, uh, because he, he's the perfect source of fatherhood. Communicate and forgive. Ask, will you forgive me? Offer forgiveness, I forgive you. Uh, and persevere. One of the things my dad would say is, uh, is as he worked with parents, he, he, was, he said, um, kids pick up on the tone of your conversation. And they can tell if you're worried that they're not going to turn out. Uh, in fact, we, we, had some, we had some friends who we, meet, we met with them for marriage counseling. They were incredible marriage counselors. And they said, we got marriage figured out, but we can't figure it out parenting. We, we don't know what to do with that, our kids. And their kids felt that. They, they felt their uncertainty <coughs> and, and fear. In fact, uh, I can remember him saying to his kid, if you keep going like that, you're going to end up in prison someday. And that's exactly what happened. His child up, ended up in prison because his, he, he was actually speaking words of identity and doubt that ended up self-fulfilling. And so uh, I, I can remember, I, I can remember he, hearing from my parents that, you know what, God's working in you. You're going to turn out. Like this is a <laughs> tough time, but it's going to be okay because we, we, we're convinced that, that God's in this and he's going to get us to the other side. And I remember there's one little stretch where my dad got really worried about me when I was a teenager and I was kind of rebellious. And he told me once in the morning, he said, uh, Dave, I didn't sleep last night because I'm so worried about you. I just don't know how you're going to, I don't know where, I don't know where you're going to end up. And that was so terrifying to me mm -hmm. that my dad hadn't, didn't have confidence in my future. <laughs> that, you know, that I, I remember writing him a letter saying, Dad, I, I really, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to make it. You know, really. Uh, it was, it was just so, uh, his, his, his concern. So it was a lot better when he said, this is a tough stretch, but I believe God's going to get us through it. This is, this is a big problem, but we're going to persevere till we're out the other end. And that's what Connie did with the boys. We're not going to let this stay where this is, is. And if it takes 10 tries, 
we're going to hang in there because we, we, um, we believe God is in it. And again, that's no guarantee your kids are going to turn out. <laughs> so that's just the other, the other thing is, is uh, Jesus had 12 disciples and one of them was a traitor. Uh, you can do everything right and your kids can still choose not to follow God. Uh, but I, I think we need to be in a position of faith and expectancy as parents. And then here's this last one, pray. And pray for your kids. Pray with them, pray for them. When people would ask my parents, how did your kids all turn out so well? My, I can just hear my mom saying it. She said over and over again, a lot of people prayed. That was that, that's her standard answer. If you ask my mom, if you ask my dad, why did your kids all turn out? They'll say a lot of people prayed. Now, I as their child say, yeah, and you did a lot of things really well, you know? But their, their picture is a lot of people prayed. We prayed a lot. And, um, and prayer really is, is, uh, is central to family on mission.